everyone, welcome to another edition of Harona and I am Harona Drame. Tonight I have a young lady as my special guest. No other person than Ajola Jallo, a former employee of the World Bank, now a full-time farmer in the Gambia. Ajola, welcome to Harona. Thank you Harona, thank you for having me. So, uh, we typically would start from childhood. Where did you grow up from? I mean, you're relatively too young to have retired from the World Bank. <laughs> That's quite true. Uh, I grew up partially here in, um, in Banjul, <clears throat> and then I left around the age of eight to, to live in, the, in New York. My father was posted as an ambassador. And um, I went to school in, in New York and uh, high school. Mm -hmm. I did university there also. Mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, uh, from there uh, landed my first gig uh, as a as a imp serious job mm -hmm. with uh, Fannie Mae, Fannie Mae as an analyst. Yeah, in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. and uh, then finding my way to to IFC, the World Bank. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, uh, most of my uh, career has not been as a farmer, but working in places like Bear Stearns on the trading floor, fixed income. You know, uh, or perhaps again in a mortgage-backed uh, security comp firm in the middle of Park Avenue in Manhattan. So all of those have been amazing, but they weren't farming. Your childhood, what did you remember of your early years in Banjul? I mean, until the age of eight you were here, but what are the memories that you, you have of Banjul as a child? Um, if anything, I remembered green. <clears throat> I remembered um, the greenery of things. Uh, plants and flowers and um, you know the the very sort of gigantic baobab trees always towering above um, and I spent a lot of time too on my father's farm you know we uh, early morning weekends we were there and uh, we spent time working you know when we would go there we would actually work like everybody else so um, I think that was my connection that and uh, playing football you were playing shoes. football. Yes, playing soccer. You were soccer. a tomboy. I was, I was a, you know what, we call it a tomboy, but um, I have to say my parents didn't have restrictions on me, if anything. Uh, so yeah, I was... You have brothers? I have brothers, I do. And you still were able to be a boy? Uh, I was still, I was allowed to compete. They let me pe play. Um, I remember being very young when I was even younger. Um, sometimes they didn't have a goal post. Mm -hmm. So they would put the rock mm -hmm. and they would put me. Okay, so I would, I would be the second goal post. Okay. And that's how I, I got really good reflexes because of that. Mm -hmm. So um, when they were told, look, you're going to play, take her along with you. They're like, ah, we don't want to take her. Mm. So they'll take me along and I would be the second goal post. Okay. And um, yeah. And that <laughs> you have played more football than I have. Is that so? <laughs> uh, because I've never played football in my life. Okay, all right. Those, those were things that I never had. Okay. Now, when you went to New York, mm -hmm. big city, yeah. uh, quite a difference from Banjul. That's true. How did you find settling in and fitting in? Um, I guess I didn't realize how Gambian I was or how, where I had come from until I left. Meaning that uh, mm -hmm. we were the only black people mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, that was something interesting. You don't know that you're different mm -hmm. until you're put in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. um, or being told sometimes, um, you know, we were, we were speaking our local dialects, speaking Wolof, speaking Fula, mm -hmm. and um, realizing that our English had an accent. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you don't realize that until you go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But I think nevertheless, um, you know, my parents were very open-minded and, uh, you know, in the space that we're in, mm -hmm. it, it was at first, it was difficult, but then um, as a child, you kind of get accustomed to anything. One of the struggles you would also have would be um, in academics, you know, mm -hmm. the curriculum would be different. Mm -hmm. they, of course, you did touch on the difference in accent mm -hmm. because uh, American English and our Gambianized British English yes which is quite a contrast yes so fitting in with that okay but how did you find settling in class in school did mm. you find it uh, challenging a lot more or did you find it uh, a less a lot less challenging um, it's actually a contradiction because growing up in the Gambia we were used to writing essays at Ndaus mm -hmm. every morning we started our classes with writing an essay mm -hmm. and uh, what that did was that um, I was sort of much more advanced 
in when it came to my writing skills. Mm -hmm. So when I went to the U.S. in class, my teachers were they were amazed. They were like, "Wow, this you know, mm. the African, African this African girl, wow, yeah. you write so well, mm. or your 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 spelling is awesome." Yeah. But at the same time, although I had amazing spelling, amazing vocabulary, mm -hmm. I had an accent. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to put me in ESL class. Mm -hmm. ESL, for those who don't know, English is English as language. a second language. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, well, that doesn't make sense. I pass all my uh, spelling exit tests, great essay writing, but now you say I'm in ESL. You know, and, and that was something that um, I had to fight, and my parents had to fight too. They, they simply explained to them that, look, in the Gambia, you know, they have a British type of English. Mm -hmm. And also, she has an accent, but doesn't mean that she speaks English any less. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a bit difficult at first. Uh, it was quite difficult. Um, my mm -hmm. parents had to sit with the school and talk with them. And uh, some, some teachers said, oh yeah, of course, she doesn't need it. With time, you know, the accent will change. Mm -hmm. And uh, others said, you know, she needs the class. So these were some of the things that, you know, um, you, you, you ask yourself, well, okay, what's going on here? But um, yeah, they, they accept it. And I think, <laughs> yeah. That, great, but your first winter, oh, coming from a tropical country, and there you were, ice was falling out of the sky. I think uh, the problem with that is the first winter, um, it wasn't just the ice falling, but the fact that we wanted to eat it. <laughs> yeah. So nobody told us that we couldn't eat it. And um, here we were, and everything you've seen, the green, everything's replaced now. It's kind of gray. I mean, the, the snow is all the way to the top. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, our parents had gotten us all these coats and all these things. And, you know, normally you don't wear all, you know, you don't, you're not so encumbered by clothing when you're here. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and there we were. Finally, we're all dressed up and we're l let out of the door. And you're looking at this mountain of, of white. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to do? just jump inside of it mm -hmm. we just jumped we just went crazy and we were eating it left to right and okay within an hour later we were sick yeah. and uh, nearly numb and freezing and the worst part of it is um, we thought well you're cold yeah. so what do you do when you're cold how about you get warm yeah so we got back went to the bathroom and put on the hot water mm. and got into the tub with really hot water mm -hmm. that was awful I, I will never forget that feeling in my life. So, um, if anything they tell you about snow and ice, it's not about how to dress. Whatever you do when you're cold, do not put yourself in something hot because it was the most excruciating pain. And all of a sudden, I realized I, had, I wasn't in Gambia anymore. Welcome to New York. The buildings. I, I know when I first went to New York, mm -hmm. and for some reason, our flight got there at night. Yeah. Miles and miles away, you could see heaven. Right. I mean, I always sit by a window. Yeah. And you could see heaven, the lights, the glare. You get on the ground, the buildings, mm -hmm. the noise, the cars, the people. Everybody yeah. is going somewhere. Everybody is in a hurry. I mean, how did you as a child saw that first picture in a Manhattan area, for example, or in any part of New York, really? It's busy as always. I think it was so intense that the only thing I, I could see were basically my father's, uh, lower part of my father's body, his hands, mm -hmm. meaning that I just focused on that. I focused on him and then my, my, my siblings um, because uh, it, it felt like they were all coming towards me and I couldn't strain my neck uh, hard enough to, to, to look up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would keep looking up and it would just keep going and it didn't make any sense mm -hmm. and I kept thinking, are these people going to fall out of the house? Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't understand how the people were in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just so bright. And leaving my country, and I remember we flew out at night. You mm -hmm. know, I could, we could count how many lights there were mm -hmm. at that time at the airport. Mm -hmm. And to now come to a place that was so bright, and it was at night time. And uh, I just remember that it was, it was just... It was amusing, but it was terrifying, and it was fascinating, because I kept thinking, are the people going to fall out of the building? Mm -hmm. So I would look up, but then fear that, well, somebody would fall, fall out and fall, fall on top of me. So I, I just, my, my world would really be just where my father's hands were. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's all, that's the only thing I looked at, and I would focus on that the whole time. But, um, oh. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, that's the experiences from Banjul to New York. And we'll take our first break here when we come back more with Ajola Jalo. Stay with us. Welcome back to Harona with my special guest, Ajola Jalo. Now, we talked about Gambia growing up, uh, New York and your ice-eating days. Yeah. <laughs> now, we, we're back to uh, you after college, after university, right. your first jobs. And uh, in fact, maybe we start from choosing a career mm -hmm. when you were perhaps in high school or yeah. maybe a bit younger. Yeah. You decided, for me, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And what was that choice? Well, there were two things. Um, the choice I said was that uh, I believed I was going to be a doctor. Medical. Medical doctor, yes. Mm -hmm. Because um, everyone told me, or I heard often that uh, Africa needs doctors. Mm -hmm. Africa needs doctors and um, so I said, yes, I'm going to be a doctor. Because Africa needs me. Yes, because Africa needs doctors. Um, I think that's what happens sometimes when you are, have an opportunity to study abroad or go outside of your country. You feel a sense of um, uh, sort of a, a need to, 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 to do something, to give back, to, to, to help somehow. That mm -hmm. you've, you've had this opportunity now, you've got to give something back. Mm -hmm. And um, people tell you all the time that, well, you know, okay, you're from Africa. Yeah, great. Oh, I heard about, you know, the situation there, and so I, it was inundated everywhere I went. I would hear, Africa needs doctors. So I naturally, I said, okay, I'll be a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, first year of college, I was pre-med, mm -hmm. and I did extremely well. Mm -hmm. And then I, I dropped, I dropped it. Why? It, it wasn't what I wanted to do. It was because everybody wanted you to do it. Exactly. It I wasn't uh, yeah. a choice. I knew what I wanted to be. You know, um, I wanted to be a farmer, um, but I would, you know, on the quad, hanging out with friends, we would sit and I'd tell them, look, I need to be at the Scottish Agricultural College. And they would tell me, go. I'm like, I can't go. What am I going to tell my parents? You know, I'm attending a private uh, university. Mm -hmm. I attended private school, mm -hmm. meaning that they paid school fees mm -hmm. in foreign currency. Can you yeah. imagine? Yeah. So, um, I, I, nobody ever said it's okay to be a farmer. I haven't seen any role model farmers anywhere or any farmers with influence and decision making uh, power. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing of that sort. So I kept it to myself and I dropped pre-med and I said, all right, I went into economics instead. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you know, economics is a social science. It covers everything. And maybe one day I can go into some sort of international development. And I led with that. Um, and that took me to, to the middle of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have confidence to be a farmer, but I had confidence to be in the middle of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Again, saying, you know what, what is acceptable? Yeah. And uh, I always powered on, but nevertheless, it was always there. That the, the, the drive, the passion, you know, everywhere I went, I would be that person at parties talking to you and telling you why cashews were better than peanuts. And you're <laughs> that will be quite uh, a boring conversation. <laughs> what is it? But yeah. Wall Street, the bulls, the bears, and all of it. Yeah. How did you survive there? How did I survive? Yeah. Well, I think um, just like I was a second goalpost when yeah. I was a child, yeah. <laughs> it was the same thing. Um, a, a sense of, 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 uh, of, of who I was and um, my foundation, knowing where I come from. You know, uh, both parents are very hardworking, um, they're very focused uh, individuals and they always said, you know what, no matter where you are, always try your, do your level best above and beyond. Mm -hmm. And um, it was intense in the sense that you're required to be more than yourself. They said, you know, you, you can show up at 8 o'clock in the morning. We showed up at 8. Then after it became 7.30 in the morning, then it became 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then you know what? I used to arrive around 5.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, it's about pushing yourself. And uh, because then you look around and you say, why, why can't it be done? You know, there's an expectation there. And um, you look around and maybe you don't see someone else that looks like you. Maybe you're the only African female on the entire trading floor. Mm -hmm. And um, weakness is not something that is that is a, a company, uh, that is a weakness is not something that is accepted in a, in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, um, people speak very bluntly and very directly there. Mm -hmm. They say that we have a reason we're here and uh, 
in fact, if we're not, when we're not here, we're very nice people, but when we're here, we have a target and a goal. So you learn how to not take things personally. Mm-hmm. And I think that was, that was really it. And the moments I had to cry, I went into the ladies' room mm-hmm. and I cried very quietly. Mm-hmm. And uh, you fixed your face and then you came back out because you realized that it wasn't about you, that you, know, you had a, have a goal. And I think um, that's what carries through now to understand that, you know what, some things are outside of yourself and not to take it personally. So, so how did you shift from Wall Street to the World Bank again? Yes, exactly. So um, I took a position in the, at, at IFC. Because so you thought it was less demanding and less uh, 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 bullish. Um, at that, no, no, but at the time, I think we have to backtrack, but uh, mm-hmm. that was later. I moved to DC, so mm-hmm. I got a great offer getting paid a lot of money, money mm-hmm. at, uh, at Fannie Mae. Mm-hmm. And uh, also the, I have then later at IFC is an international, sort of international development. Mm-hmm. And I felt like the work I'd be doing there would somehow bring me closer to the Gambia because it would be development work focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, um, even though I wasn't directly on the field doing what I wanted to do as a farmer Mm -hmm. to help my country, I felt that now working in an organization that was focused on that, somehow I was doing my share. Mm -hmm. You know, and I I think that that's, that that's a drive with, with, with the World Bank and the IFC. IFC. I said that, you know, all the things I'm doing are connected somehow Mm -hmm. to, to helping my country and helping, you know, there's this sense of helping the continent overall. When I say the continent, I, I'm talking about Africa. Yes. But, um, like, sincerely, that's the feeling that I have. And it's, it was great. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't enough. It Why wasn't, not? It wasn't enough for me. You know, um, I had a chance to, to be in a project here for the World Bank in the Gambia, for Gambia, Casamas, and Senegal in agriculture. And, uh, you know, it still it wasn't enough. I, I had to be on the ground because I felt like I was on the sidelines for too long, you know, and leading by example works. I didn't have a role model. Mm-hmm. I didn't have anybody telling me that it's okay to be a farmer as a career choice. Mm-hmm. And I said, it's not my parents holding me back. It's not even society. That fear and that questioning was myself. And finally I said, you know what, it's, it's all right. I'm ready now to, to, to be the person I need to be, mm-hmm. to be that role model for myself. Because I overwhelmingly believe in agriculture and its ability to create employment all across the value chain. It's an industry that creates viable employment, meaning that you can have a dignified living and, and, and earn money for yourself, work independently, mm-hmm. and it provides jobs for, for, um, for for a major- like a majority of the, of the society. Mm-hmm. So um, that overwhelming drive mm-hmm. finally became a life calling. Mm-hmm. And I said, all right, I'm going to be a farmer. And December 16th, uh, 2016, mm-hmm. when Gambia seemed set mm-hmm. to be embroiled in some sort of chaos, mm-hmm. I was on a plane coming back to the Gambia. Mm-hmm. Why to be a farmer? With everything going wrong, I was coming back t- specifically to come and work this soil. Because irrespective of what was going to happen, mm-hmm. again, I knew that any country worth being independent, any country worth standing on its own, has to be able to feed itself. Mm-hmm. And I was back. Interesting moment to be back in Gambia okay. and we're going to take our second break right here when we come back New Gambia and more with Ajola Jalo. Stay with us. Welcome back to Harona and this is our final segment with my special guest Ajola Jalo. Hey, we, we talked about Banjul growing up, we talked about New York, we mm-hmm. talked about the funny maze, we talked about how bullish you were <laughs> on the floor of trading and mm-hmm. the World Bank. Yeah. But December 2016, when Gambians were going into Senegal like flies, people who could afford it were flying out of the country, you decided to fly in the country. Mm-hmm. at such a moment. How do you see New Gambia? 
for me, um, we went through something so inconceivable. I feel that we haven't properly processed it yet. Perhaps we're still dealing with it mm -hmm. in, in whatever way. Mm -hmm. But for me, the new Gambia only means one thing. It means work, mm -hmm. hard work. Um, perhaps what has happened now has pushed us to, to, to even think of ourselves as Gambia collectively. Mm -hmm. For so long we didn't, but this shared experience, it's, it's something that we've all shared, irrespective of your tribe, mm -hmm. of your socioeconomic background, your education, whether you're from the diaspora or not, mm -hmm. you know, everybody dealt with it, Every, everybody experienced it. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that, that's a collective experience, that's something that for once we say we shared it together as Gambians. Mm -hmm. And from there, what I pulled from there, is that now that we know, we understand that we're Gambians as a group, to have that sort of national idea or identity, mm -hmm. from there, what do we do with it? It's, it's about hard work. Mm -hmm. Because the country needs, it needs people to work. It needs to move somehow. If I'm coming to this as a farmer, I'm one single farmer. I can't make a dent in the market. The fact that we can't even supply uh, the demand we have locally. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure we have others that are willing to come on board as farmers. Mm -hmm. Young people that say, you know what, this is a career for me. Mm -hmm. We can't all go into the offices. Mm -hmm. Some of us can. But I'm telling you that where is the work? In agriculture, offers you an opportunity to be your own boss. You don't want someone telling you what to do, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I don't really know where over a hectare of papaya can give you $22,000 a month if you're doing something legal in Gambia. Mm -hmm. I harvested less than 200 kilos of onions on Saturday. Mm -hmm. People don't like to talk about money, but I'll tell you what. I've made more than $10,000 between last weekend and now. Mm -hmm. Just selling onions. Just selling onions. Mm -hmm. I left high paying jobs great title um, why not only because I felt a responsibility to my country to doing something here but also mm -hmm. it made sense because there's a there's money in it it makes sense there's money in it uh, women folks my mother is from Sukuta okay and uh, gardening is known yeah generally yes I mean Sukuta, Bakau, Yundum, mm -hmm. Brikama yes uh, some sort of the breadbasket of this region right. when they talk about mm -hmm. salad, tomatoes, yes. and certain uh, produce. Yes. They've done this all year round, mm -hmm. during the rains, after the rains. Mm -hmm. So it's not totally alien no. that women are in agriculture. Mm -hmm. What I do find interesting sometimes is um, how organized mm -hmm. as a group yes. they are. Mm -hmm. Because they've done groupings in yeah. Sukuta, we yeah. had the narcos, and yeah. then they will do communal work together. Right. But then you will see that at the end of every trading season, it, there will be new suitcases of clothes, and mm -hmm. then a Bakuyate will be invited, and mm -hmm. the major parties will happen. That's true. Now that we have a female minister for the first time right. for agriculture, yes. Do you think? All of these energies can now be organized and structured and women leading it. Um, I think when you talk about at the end of trading, there's Jalibar Kuyates and things like that, is because agriculture is actually not embraced as a business, as a private activity per se. If it's embraced as a business from the get go, it really does. Does, does dictate how you spend what you earn. As a business, you'll say, I'll reinvest it, mm -hmm. or the business needs this, or this is beyond, you know, this is for the business. And that's one of the number one things that I try on my little platform, uh, push and say that, you know what, it's about changing our mentality that agriculture is a business and it's a private activity in many ways. With the new, uh, with Madame Ami Fabre, as the Minister of Agriculture, she's a farmer. Yeah. I can tell you that, I've been to her farm. 
Uh, she's a hardworking farmer. And uh, for over 30 years, she's in, she believes in agriculture. She believes in it as a business. And, uh, you know, actually just sitting there and saying, this is a cassava. And telling you, you know what, this cassava, get, don't look at a cassava as just as a cassava. This is how much a cassava would get. So having somebody uh, who's, who's, who, 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 who sees agriculture and its potential and knows it, mm -hmm. I believe that she's going to be a great driver. Because she understands what the women go through. Mm -hmm. Literally, the saying, walk in my shoes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's finally saying that, you know, we have these bread baskets, we had these nacos, but nothing's changed there. Mm -hmm. For decades, when you go there, there's no advancement. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that you'll see some new mechanical implement, uh, some sort of machinery. Mm -hmm. Hardly. Much less even uh, to say uh, you see a solar-powered borehole. Mm -hmm. For the most part, you still see well water. Mm -hmm. So I believe that for the most part now, perhaps with, with a, a, a woman as a Minister of Agriculture, mm -hmm. um, she's a very practical-minded person, by the way. And I, I believe that how she would approach this is to see it in, in a practical sense and pushing that agriculture is business. And I think in taking it from that perspective, there really is a chance now, not only to organize, but for advancement. And advancement is not for only the women who are already in the garden, but also for the youth. To say that, you know what, you said uh, maybe I was relatively too young to go into agri, to become a farmer. Mm -hmm. I could have waited 10 years. I tell you, I, I'm, I was too, I'm too old. I should have started at the very beginning, already in primary school, already in high school, taking the way towards, with agricultural studies, to saying this, this was a roadmap to becoming a farmer as a mm -hmm. career, with STEM classes focusing specifically on growing techniques, mm -hmm. you know, irrigation systems. You know, that's the only way to arm ourselves to make sure that we're, we have an agro industry that's modern. So you're talking about mechanization and uh how vital that may be for agriculture and in feeding the breadbasket for the country. And overall in education, and, and ed a specific education, agricultural education. You know, um, not just as an elective, but act at a very young age being exposed to that. You know, to be told that it's okay, that you, you want to be a doctor, that's great. You want to be a lawyer, guess what? You can also be a farmer. It's a dignified career choice. Yeah. This will actually sustain you and your family. <laughs> My company believes grow her, grow the world. Because anytime you've grown the incomes of women, you've grown the family, you've grown the society. So oh, it's men, because men will bring <coughs> it back to their women and their children, no? No, of course, of course. Uh, but I'm taking from the, the stock that's already there, but that's quite true. I mean, this has been statistically known. I think that's why now we're pushing more for trade, in, including women. Uh, large companies that were mostly men are saying, guess what, we need to make sure we diversify and have more women on board, because it makes economic and business sense. Um, you know, in my encouraging people to get into farming, Farming is both women and, and men, mm -hmm. young women and young men, you know? And to say that this is really a way for you to make your money here. Uh, by way of last question, yeah. what message would you have for young women, women, as it relates to agriculture, farming, sustainability, and the future? Um, what I'm doing is not so different. You know, um, our mothers have done it, our grandmothers have done it, but how I'm doing it is different. I'm not a farmer, per se. I'm a businesswoman whose business happens to be farming. And I think for many young women who might not have considered farming as an option for them, uh, if I put it to them like this, I say that, you know what, you are a businesswoman, but your business is that of farming, is that of agriculture. Why? Because it's a business that makes sense, not just in this environment. It's a business that you can count on to sustainably and continuously provide you with income. You know, it's a business that um, allows you at the same time, whether you have considerations for family commitments, children, it also allows you that kind of flexibility. And um, for someone like myself who I've had a chance to travel and, and, and live abroad, you know, it's just as appealing or even more so because of all the things that come into it. 
you know it's challenging it's exciting and um, I, I'm, I'm standing on a platform that I never thought I would I, I, I could manage you know I'm managing seven hectares mm -hmm. you know and, and you really get to grow the business as you want um, and at the same time you, you really see that you're contributing to your own country to your own society you know this feeling of making something that you've achieved something you could see that I mean uh, it's it's something that your, your, your clients are happy to see you all the time you know um, it, it's a it's it's really a career where honestly it's I, I, I I'm going to sound very partial it's very noble mm -hmm. you know it's very noble and you can be proud to get into it and um, and it pays <laughs> I need pace. Thank you very much, Ajola Jalo. It's been great having you on the show. Thank you, Haruna. It's my pleasure. Thanks. So, thank you. <laughs>